they could still hold information in the focus of attention really well, even being kept awake 51 hours. What we found is that people are absolutely devastated in the more cognitive flexibility part, in that ability to say, all of a sudden I'm getting some feedback that says this strategy is not working anymore. Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. My name is Jesse Lawler. I am your host, and this is the 213th episode of this podcast dedicated to anything and everything that we can do to give you bankable advice in the care and feeding of your own brain. This is going to be one of those don't step on this cognitive landmine episodes. Figured it would be a good one to start the new year on, probably worth touching on this topic at least once a year, because contrary to the way that we wish the human brain works, sometimes learning something once is not enough. Repetition matters, especially when something is part of your daily life. And so today we are going to be talking about sleep, and in particular, not getting enough sleep and what happens to the brain in that case. Also, some of the fine grained details on what you may or may not be able to get away with cognitively while sleep deprived. In the main interview, I'm going to be talking with Dr. Paul Whitney, who has made sleep deprivation research a major part of his career. If you hang around for the ruthless listener retention gimmick at the end, I will tell you about how nematodes fall asleep. Nematodes, by the way, if you don't remember from high school biology class, are very, very small worms, just on the border of being too small to actually see with the naked eye, but very well studied. Also, going to double up in the ruthless listener retention gimmick, dangle one more thing for you. There's a really, really spooky, this is like a Halloween thing, a ghost story about sleep deprivation. If you're telling creepy campfire stories and sleep deprivation comes up, this will be a good one to have in the repertoire. All that's at the end. For right now, let's kick things off as usual with This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts, This Week in Neuroscience. So scientists and mathematicians at the RAND Corporation famously study lots of important issues like how to avoid getting into nuclear wars, but they also look at more pedestrian concerns like how does your choice of where you live potentially affect your cognitive health? And according to their research published in the American Journal of Preventative Medicine, it seems to be better for the average brain to be living in the city versus living in the country. This is based on data collected in the years 2000 and 2010, the same study done 10 years apart, which looked at more than 16,000 adults aged 55 and older. Their cognitive function was assessed in a 27-point telephone interview for cognitive status. A score of 12 or above on this test was considered normal cognitive function. A score of 6 or less indicated dementia, and 7 to 11 was cognitive impairment without dementia. And in case you're wondering, can a severely cognitively impaired person really answer a phone questionnaire? In both cases, there were a percentage of people, 8.6% in 2000, 4.8% in 2010, where the information was gathered by proxy, by a spouse or a caretaker or something like that. They also gathered the data that you would expect on age, gender, race, ethnicity, total number of children, marital status, highest educational attainment, and net total assets. They also looked at health conditions like high blood pressure, cancer, diabetes, lung cancer, heart disease, trying to see where the most interesting correlation showed up. The overall incidence of dementia was higher in rural areas, 5.1% versus 4.4% in 2010, so the rate of dementia diminished between 2000 and 2010 and approximately triple those numbers for the people with cognitive impairment but no dementia. Overall, looking at the urban-rural divide, they saw that the fully adjusted relative risk ratio was 60% higher for dementia, 44% higher for cognitive impairment without dementia in rural areas compared to urban areas in 2000, those respective numbers 80% and 40% higher in 2010. And by the way, if you're thinking of this sounds awful binary, that there's a lot of people that live in areas that are not exactly urban, but not exactly rural either. They did take that into account. They looked at the zoning and they had some areas classified as 100% urban, others as 100% rural. And then they did have two middle ground categories, mixed urban and mixed rural, they called them, where the respondents numbers got proportionally allocated to either the urban or the rural group. According to the RAND researchers, the most important factor in reducing rural-urban disparities is educational attainment, where they typically saw higher levels of education among the urban dwellers than the rural dwellers. And remember that these are people who are at least 55 years old in 2010 or possibly even 2000, so this is really reflective of what the state of education was in the middle 20th century. But looking at those numbers, they found that education was protective against both dementia and cognitive impairment, yielding between an 83 and 89 percent lower relative risk ratio for people who had had more than 12 years of education, which in this case you would get over the wire with kindergarten through 12th grade. You wouldn't necessarily have to attend university, says the lead investigator Margaret M. Whedon. 
Our findings linking rural adults' recent gains in cognitive functioning with the improved rates of high school graduation provides a new example of how public investment in education can narrow population health disparities. The absence of any prior evidence about the rates and disparities in dementia and cognitive impairment by rural residents has certainly hampered the ability of these communities to advocate for continued investment in rural health care and long-term care services. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast so smart, we have smart in our title, twice. We picked up a couple of five-star reviews this week on iTunes. Listener Corollary from the UK says, I love how efficient this podcast is at delivering information. Just straight to the point, no fluff, just what a podcast on this topic should be. And listener Theo Malcritio from the USA says, Could do without the corny announcer. Let's keep the topic serious, folks. But he still gave five stars, so glad the announcer wasn't too much of a turnoff. The announcer actually is one of my best friends from university who actually is a real voiceover guy in the real world. So he's pretty much cooked into the mix at this point, but constructive criticism is welcome, as of course are positive comments. Thanks to everyone who's been leaving reviews or otherwise spreading the word on Smart Drug Smarts. Actually got two Brain Breakfast newsletters out there in less than the space of a week, something that almost never happens, but lightning does occasionally strike. If you are not on the Brain Breakfast mailing list and you'd like to be, you can sign up for that at smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter. Now that the new year has kicked off, there is a big new promotion going on over at Vitamunk.com. Vitamunk, as you know, a nutritional supplement sponsor with a wide array of products, everything from Alpha GPC to Resveratrol to a whole lot of stuff in between. And the deal that they're doing now for the month of January, this is somewhat tied to the start of the new year. For anybody that signs up for a subscription order during the month of January, so you go to their website, Vitamunk.com, you fill up an order card, and at purchase, you can click either subscription or one-time purchase. And for any subscription that started in the month of January, if you still Stick with the subscription for three months or beyond. This goes on three months, six months, 12 months. Basically, each three-month anniversary of the subscription starting, you can get anything else on their shelf for the cost of shipping and handling. So you can kind of taste test some different things that they've got throughout the course of the year. If you've got your supplement shelf pretty much stabilized, but you're like, hmm, I wonder what it would be like to add this thing. Every three months, you can do that as a freebie. So pretty cool deal and kind of a uh, choose-your-own-adventure over the course of the year. And that, once again, is at vitamunk.com. And in reverse alphabetical order, but probably still no surprise, over at axonlabs.io, you can find both Nexus and Mitogen. Nexus are aniracetam-based nootropic stack, and Mitogen for mitochondrial support. Mitochondria, of course, being the power plants within each of the cells of your body. If you ever want to completely geek out on a scientific topic, here's a recommendation I'll just drop. Read up on mitochondria and the galactic unlikelihood of their getting organized into what we now know as eukaryotic cells, the cells of all higher life forms on Earth. If you really, really want to have one of those wig out thought sessions where you're thinking, oh, how far does the universe go? Or, you know, what was the unlikelihood of the particular sperm that wound up being me beating all the other sperm? Mitochondria provide another one of those big scientific mind benders if you get into reading about them. Obviously, I might have done a bit too much of that, but I'll, I'll cut myself off here. But nevertheless, the customary hat tip to axonlabs.io. Smart Drug Smarts. Dr. Paul Whitney is a professor and researcher at Washington State University in their Department of Psychology, and he spends a lot of time trying to slice and dice exactly what people aren't able to do as well when they are sleep deprived. And since we've had a couple episodes before about how sleep works, the importance of sleep, dreaming, lucid dreams, several related areas, but we haven't really gotten into the nitty gritty of sleep deprivation. And talking with Dr. Whitney seemed like a great way of tying some of these ideas together. We've got so many large-scale public health disasters in progress right now. We've got the obesity epidemic, the opioid epidemic, this increasing love-hate relationship with our digital devices and social media and the potential downsides there. And probably a junior partner in this gaggle of things to worry about is just general widespread sleepiness. And probably of all of these, being underslept might be the most insidious because there's the least public visibility of the problem because not a whole lot of people are going to know how much you sleep in a given night and therefore there's not a lot of social pressure to clean up your act if you're sleep hygiene is not particularly good, but there are a lot of reasons to take it seriously, and we'll be hearing those reasons coming up next with Dr. Paul Whitney. I was trained as an experimental cognitive psychologist. The first half of my career, I worked in the area of working memory, attention, and language, and got really interested in an area that's called cognitive control, how we manage the information processing system. And then some years ago, I guess probably around a dozen years ago now, Hans Van Dongen joined WSU as part of the Sleep and Performance Research Center, which he now directs. 
And Hans is a circadian physiologist. So he studies sleep and circadian rhythms and was interested in the cognitive consequences of sleep and had done some work in that area, but really didn't have the cognitive background about what to measure and how to disentangle different issues. And I have another colleague here that I had started to work with on sort of the connection between affect, motivation, and cognition. And so the three of us teamed up around this issue of sleep deprivation effects on cognition. For us, it's kind of a really interesting issue because the fascinating thing to me about sleep deprivation effects are that they're not really as blunt an instrument as you might expect. People who are affected by sleep deprivation can do some things perfectly well and other things, sometimes even things that don't seem that complicated, can be dramatically affected. So it's almost like a temporary brain lesion in the sense that when people are affected by sleep deprivation, there is some specificity to the effects. But unlike brain lesions, we can measure folks before, during, and after sleep deprivation. So you can do true experiments and not have to wonder about what the brain was like before you're observing some sort of damage. I guess that sort of jives intuitively with how the brain behaves when it is asleep. I mean, we know that people can be sleepwalkers and things like that. So even in full consciousness lacking sleep, there's lots of stuff that still can happen. So I guess it shouldn't be surprising that it's not a general condition when somebody is quote unquote sleepy. Yeah, that's a good observation. Sometimes what we say is that sleep is not a whole brain phenomenon. There's different things going on and different parts are more or less active at different times while sleeping. And it does follow that under sleep deprivation, the effects are not going to be uniform. And we're really trying to figure out what's more or less affected. But the other issue that I think is really fascinating is people aren't like old style computing devices where you put in some input and there's some algorithms and you get some output. People are really active processors of information. And when people are in challenging circumstances like sleep deprivation or dual tasking or the various sorts of challenges, we're not always processing information under ideal conditions. We actively try to adapt to those challenges. So it's not like something's just going in and affecting the brain under sleep deprivation. People try to work around their limitations and right. the strategies or the things, and it might not even be conscious strategies, but the way our nervous system adapts to challenge, I think is one of the really interesting things going on in cognitive neuroscience that really hasn't gotten a lot of attention till very recently. Yeah. I mean, I can think of experiences when I've been driving late at night and you know, wanted to just get the last couple of hours home and you do stupid stuff like you sing to songs you don't like, or you sit on your seat belt in an intentionally uncomfortable way, all sorts of things that you would never normally do to stay awake a little bit longer. Right, exactly. And one of the things that sleep deprivation we've known for a long time has a really profound effect on is what's usually referred to as vigilance your ability to engage in sustained attention, which of course, you know, driving's all about that. Be able to scan your environment, keep alert enough to drive safely. And the things that you mentioned, and you reminded me of a graduate school colleague a long time ago on long trips, he used to bring a push pin with him and he said he would stick it in his thigh to keep himself yeah. awake. So people do all sorts, as you said, all sorts of weird things yeah. to stay awake. And so for a long time, people thought that sleep deprivation affects alertness, vigilance, so you have lapses of attention. And the other cognitive things that we see in sleep deprivation, maybe they're just a downstream effect of you're missing some information because of these attentional lapses. But that turns out not to be true. There's some other things going on in sleep deprivation and how it affects our cognitive system that really are separate from its effects on alertness. But people are really a conscious of the alerting effects. And if they're kind of having little micro sleeps, they're just sort of dropping off for a second. People can kind of combat that. These other things that we're more interested in measuring, they're more subtly affecting us and we're not as aware of them. And people just aren't really a good judge of how affected they are by sleep deprivation. So it'll make us maybe take some chances on a drive or on other things, making decisions that maybe we shouldn't do. The studies there have been really interesting on people's inability to correctly gauge just how impaired they actually are. 
It's actually a pretty easy issue to get your hands around in that there are well-researched and worked out scales for people to use to estimate their sleepiness. And you can use these same scales across different studies. But over and over, not just in our work, but in a lot of other work that you can find in the literature, you can look at the relationship or run a correlation between people's subjective fatigue or subjective sleepiness and their objective performance. And they tend not to correlate correlate very well. So people just don't have, for most kinds of performance decrements, they don't have a very good sense of how impaired they actually are. That's not too surprising because we're really not that great a judge of our own behavior or our own capacities, even when we're rested. Right. We tend to overestimate how well we're going to do on certain kinds of tasks, and we tend not to be terribly well calibrated with actual performance. And that general tendency probably gets exaggerated under sleep deprivation. It makes me think about the Dunning-Kruger effect, that thing where the worse somebody is, the more unaware they are of how bad they are. And that might be applicable in sleep loss, too. Right. Exactly. What do we know about the differences between acute sleep deprivation versus ongoing or continuous sleep deprivation over months, weeks, years? Yeah, that's a really important question because the kind of work that we do where people come into a sleep lab and one group is allowed to sleep and there's little hotel room kind of set up there and another group is kept awake, that happens in everyday life, you know, in emergency situations or disasters, first responders, but it's not nearly as common as chronic sleep restriction. So people getting four or five hours a night when they need seven or eight or nine and in general, there might be some subtle differences. There's some literature out there about this. But in general, what the research says is chronic sleep restriction gets you to the same place as our total sleep deprivation subjects. It just gets you there a little slower. And that's really the reason we study total sleep deprivation in the lab is to do chronic sleep restriction. You have to either have people in the lab a very long time and it's not practical, or you have to have it be an out in the world natural experiment where you have a lot less control. But it turns out where people have done comparisons of that, and my colleague Hans van Dagen has done some of this work, you really just get to the same place, which in a way is kind of scary because if you look at some of the things that have been done with total sleep deprivation, there was a study published in Science a number of years ago that sort of scaled the alerting or vigilance effects of sleep deprivation and slowness of reaction time, that kind of phenomenon, to comparing it to alcohol. And so you actually, with even not that much sleep deprivation, get to to the same sort of performance decrements that you see in people who are legally drunk. And that sort of scaling hasn't been done with the higher level cognition that we study, but certainly we see some absolutely profound effects on sleep deprivation on some somewhat higher cognitive processes to simple reaction time. And the idea that chronic sleep restriction is going to lead to those same phenomenon in everyday life is really a little bit frightening. People need to take getting enough sleep a little more more seriously, I think is sort of the bottom line from our research. It seems like for the last couple of years, maybe I've just been more tuned into it, but there is a growing drumbeat of public awareness around the importance of sleep. Are there any signs that the public's not just hearing this message, but actually getting it and making efforts to sleep more? I'm not aware of any. There's a lot of countervailing forces to that message. I think you're totally right. NIH and other health organizations have tried to get that message out, and it's gotten out into the popular press more. But there's a lot of things going against it. We have a very fast-paced, 24-7 lifestyle. People are still valued in a lot of walks of life for how many hours they put in and not really thinking about the trade-off of the business person that was on their 60th or 70th hour that they get a lot of pats on the back that they're really committed, but you're not necessarily aware of the downstream costs of that kind of thing. Plus, our devices that we use sometimes late at night those have effects on us. There's a lot going on in Western societies that put pressure on us 
or allow us to stay up later with entertainment options that maybe are having a negative effect on our sleep and our sleep quality that I haven't seen any evidence that we've really turned that corner. Yeah. One term that seems like it's getting bandied about now is the attention economy, basically how all sorts of economic forces are competing for people's attention. And the one thing that you can't do is attend while you're asleep. Anybody that's competing for your attention definitely doesn't want you sleeping. That's one thing they all have in common. Yeah, that's right. How do naps play into all this? I'm sure that the end game is that naps are a good thing, but for somebody that might not be able to get a full night's sleep or as much duration of total sleep as they'd like at nighttime, can naps patch the hole there? What seems to be more important than anything else is your total sleep time. There's a few caveats there. So there's a phenomenon that you're no doubt aware of, that when you first wake up, there's kind of a sleep inertia. You're not quite 100% there, especially if you nap longer than you intend. So with the exception of sleep inertia, it is true that you can make up for some lost time with naps. You know, in terms of what's sometimes called sleep hygiene, though, one of the best things that people can do is to keep a regular schedule. You don't stay up really, really late and then try to catch up on the weekends. I mean, people do that, but that's not really very effective because one of the things you're doing when you do that, and this is also true if you nap too long, that if then you throw off when you can go to sleep, what happens is you've done something to relieve your pressure for sleep, but there's a separate process of your circadian rhythm and you can get out of balance in your circadian timing so that you're not synchronized. Your internal bodily clock is not synchronized with your life clock, with the external clock. And so that can be a complicating factor too. So in general, trying to keep the same sleep schedule, the same sleep routine is a really good idea for all of those reasons. What do we know about variance from one person to the next, how much an ideal amount of sleep is? And how can a person know? I mean, it seems like this is one of these things where if you say there's a great deal of variance, some people might only need six hours, other people might need nine hours. You know, we all want to say, well, I'm probably one of those six hour people and you know, kind of fudge it for ourselves. There's an interesting answer to that question, I think, which is the question is almost always posed in the way that you posed it, where there's short sleepers and long sleepers. And there's some truth to that, but that's not really the important story, I think, for the most part. The guidelines of, you know, you want to get seven, eight hours are really good guidelines for the vast majority of people. The more interesting story about individual differences in the effects of fatigue or sleep loss on performance is that there are individual differences, but they're a lot more complicated than that way that the question's usually posed. So it's not generally that, oh, maybe I get along fine on six hours and you need seven and a half. It's more that if you and I have to stay up all night or if in a few nights in a row we're only getting four hours, you're going to be affected and I'm going to be affected, but where I'm most affected may be different from you. Mm -hmm. So the effect of sleep deprivation There are individual differences, but they manifest themselves as individual differences on different tasks. So you might not be that bad at a vigilance or driving task, but you're just devastated at some memory or cognitive control task, and I might just be just the opposite. And so part of that way that you're able to convince yourself that you're still functioning okay is maybe you're noticing that you're still performing well on those kinds of things that you can do well under sleep deprivation. But there's going to be other things where you're going to have some slippage that maybe you're not going to know it till it's too late, or maybe you won't notice it at all, but it's going to be there. That's interesting. So yeah, sort of the confirmation bias of looking for the things that you still can do pretty well at and then telling yourself that, well, I'm okay. Absolutely. How does mood, as opposed to cognitive performance per se, play in with sleep deprivation? Have they they looked at that as a separate quantity? Yeah, there's some interesting things going on with mood. There's still a lot of research that needs to be done in this area. But in general, what you see is that there are mood changes, but there's also an effect of it looks like mood may become more labile, that is more reactive. So you might get kind of giddy and jokes are funnier than they should be, but then something might upset you more than it normally would. You sort of bounce around more under sleep deprivation. Yeah. It's almost like you become childlike in a sense, how little kids can just like flip from being euphorically happy to, you know, crying like the world's on fire in in the space of a couple of seconds. Yeah. With a whole lot of sleep deprivation, I think you definitely see that. 
What current studies are you looking at with interest? What do you wish we knew that maybe with proper research could find out within the next couple of years that we don't know now? There's really a lot of stuff. So one of the areas that we're working very hard at is to try to avoid what we've come to call the task impurity problem. So, you know, it's pretty easy to take a task off the shelf from the neuropsychology battery and it's labeled a test of cognitive flexibility or it's labeled a test of attention and memory. And you run that test on people who are sleep deprived and you do or don't see that effect. And so whatever that test has been labeled, you say that is or isn't affected by sleep deprivation. But in fact, most of the tests that are used in neuropsychology test batteries, actually all the tests that are used in neuropsychology test batteries, all measure a multitude of processes. So the main thing you're interested in might be the cognitive flexibility that it's labeled as a measure of, and it might measure that ability. But at the same time, it's measuring your ability to orient to a stimulus or to hold a stimulus in the focus of attention or a number of other things. So you really have to design your experiments with batteries of measures that allow you to break down these more complex measures into their simple components that you know what is or isn't affected by sleep deprivation and really start to understand the selectivity that we spoke about a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. And that's important because, well, it's important for practical reasons in trying to extend this to real world behavior. But it's important to another reason is as we try to understand what's going on neurologically, what's going on in the brain pathways and how they're affected by sleep and sleep deprivation and to associate those brain pathways with performance, we really have to have a good understanding of exactly what our tasks are measuring and how those specific processes are implemented in the brain. So disentangling complex measures into their component cognitive processes and how that maps on to brain circuitry is a really important area that will extend out not just into sleep deprivation and performance, but really into a greater understanding of cognitive neuroscience in general. The other thing that we've started to do and some other labs are doing as well is to start to understand the relationship between some genetic variation in people and how that leads to them being more vulnerable or less vulnerable to sleep deprivation on particular tasks. So one of the things that we're really excited about is that we've seen a couple of examples now in our recent papers of resilience. You know, if you look at the overall performance level of people under sleep deprivation compared to rested control subjects, you might see this really huge effect of sleep deprivation. But you can sometimes find a subgroup within that overall group that has a particular mutation in a particular gene, and that group may not show that same effect of sleep deprivation. So seeing some evidence for a genetic resilience is very interesting, but it also plays into, again, something we talked about earlier. We don't see a genetic pattern that says, oh, I'm resilient to sleep deprivation because I have this genetic mutation and not this other genetic variation. What we see is it might give you resilience to sleep deprivation on a particular task, but it might not have anything to do with your sleep deprivation decline in performance on another task. Right. So just like the individual differences in general, it's task specific. Did those findings come from bulk analysis of the whole human genome, or did you kind of go in knowing that certain genes were going to be good candidates to be showing potential differences under sleep deprivation? So in our case, we were looking at specific genetic polymorphisms that have already been established to be related to dopamine metabolism, either in more frontally in the brain or in an area of the brain, more midbrain called the striatum. And the reason we were interested in this is there's a pathway, there's a circuit that runs between the striatum and the frontal part of the brain that is very much involved in this problem of cognitive control. You know, sometimes when you're performing a task, it's really, really important to be able to keep your current goal in mind, to keep the current problem space, the different elements of the problem you're trying to solve all actively in the focus of attention. And that's really important important to performance. Other times you're in changing environmental conditions and you need to be able to sort of let loose of holding things tightly in the focus of attention 
and be able to flexibly change your strategy or flexibly change your focus of attention as the external circumstances change. And this frontal striatal pathway is very important to that seesaw, that balance between really holding tightly on to what you're currently working on versus that more cognitive flexibility aspect. And so we went into this looking at particular genetic variations that we already knew from other research had been associated with this cognitive flexibility versus cognitive maintenance kind of distinction. Right. And the reason we did that is because, in fact, one of the first studies that our team did after we came together as a team is a whole lot of people were saying working memory or the ability to hold stuff in the focus of attention, boy, that's really devastated by sleep deprivation. And yet they hadn't really, as I talked about earlier, separated out the actual keeping things in the focus of attention part of the task from just being able to respond quickly or being able to encode or realize what the stimulus is quickly. So we did some more fine grain work to tease these things out. And what we saw in that study and some subsequent studies is that people can maintain information in the focus of attention really well under sleep deprivation, even being kept awake 51 hours. They could still hold information in the focus of attention really well. What we found in a couple of different ways now is that people are absolutely devastated under sleep deprivation in the more cognitive flexibility part, in that ability to say, oh, all of a sudden I'm getting some feedback that says this strategy is not working anymore and I need to switch gears and approach this problem a different way or start responding a different way. What we see under sleep deprivation is a lot of perseveration. That is people just sort of plowing ahead with the same old strategy, even when there's a lot of feedback that that's not working anymore. Right. And that's really potentially important because a lot of real world, especially you know, emergency scenarios or the emergency room physician who's been awake too long, you've got to be able to see that things are maybe going south. Yeah, problems almost by definition are what you don't see coming. Yeah, and that sort of cognitive flexibility is what we really see as quite devastated under sleep deprivation. And so we actually looked recently at whether the devastation in that cognitive flexibility attribute was varied with a genetic polymorphism that affects dopamine receptors that are pretty specific to the striatal area, so that the striatum end of that frontal striatal pathway. And in fact, we did find there's three possible variations that someone could have of this gene that's known as DRD2, a D2 type dopamine receptor. And one of the three groups was resilient to the sleep deprivation effects on cognitive flexibility. And the other two groups were just as we'd seen before, severe affected. Interestingly, the effect of that genetic variation was only manifest under sleep deprivation. We didn't see that genetic variation have any relationship to people's baseline performance when they were rested. That kind of makes sense because if it had effects on baseline performance when they were rested, the optimal variation would have been selected by natural selection over all of human evolution. It's really only in the past couple of hundred years since electric light when we've really had a reason to stay up past our normal circadian rhythms that the downsides of being sleep deprived would even occur frequently enough where they could be selected on. Yeah, there's definitely a good point there. I would say, though, that it's important to keep in mind that we definitely would not argue that the group that we found with this resilience to problems with cognitive flexibility under sleep deprivation, that that's something that could be selected for necessarily because we haven't identified a group of people that, oh, therefore they're better off in general because they were better off, remember, at this particular cognitive flexibility task. Right. Not only were they not better off under rested conditions, they were just as affected by sleep deprivation on other things that we measured. And that's always going to be important to keep in mind when you start to talk about genetic differences is that if something's advantageous in one domain, it actually could have a downside or a trade-off in another domain. And so these people aren't optimized in some sense. They just had an advantage in this circumstance. They might, in fact, have a disadvantage in other circumstances. 
And that's, in fact, why this literature gets so confusing. So if you take the same DRD2 gene and you look at the literature, and a lot of these studies have been done just looking at people under rested conditions, trying to say, how does this genetic variation affect cognitive performance? And it's a little frustrating because if you look at that literature, you can find four or five studies that says this group with this particular allele, this particular combination, does worse on this cognitive task. And then you can look at three or four other papers and that group that did worse are now doing better than the other groups on this other cognitive task. And again, that's because these things have particular effects But our performance depends on pathways that involve lots of parts of our brain and lots of trade-offs. So, you know, we're not heading towards being able to screen people and tell the military that, oh, they've got this genetic complement, so they're going to be better submariners and be able to stay up all night and guide the submarine. It's a lot more complicated than that. Is there a reliable way now to know at a concrete biology level, this person is too sleepy? Could we have, you know, an app on our smartphone or some way for Big Brother to ping us and say, hey, you're too tired to be doing whatever it is you're attempting? Yeah, that's an interesting goal. So here's a couple things I can say about that. There is a gold standard measure that's used in sleep deprivation research for how affected by sleep deprivation people are. It's called the psychomotor vigilance test or PVT. And the PVT is really sensitive to the effects of sleep deprivation. It's really in many ways a very simple measure where you're just having to maintain attention to a computer screen and at kind of unpredictable intervals, but on average every few seconds, a stimulus will pop up and you just have to press a button to react to that stimulus. So it's very, very simple measure. And this gets at that component that I mentioned earlier as we were chatting, this idea that vigilance or sustained attention is very affected by sleep deprivation. What we found, though, is that's a great gold standard measure for sleep deprivation effects on vigilance. But these other effects that we're talking about, effects on cognitive flexibility, for example, that are almost certainly at least as important in explaining real-world effects of sleep deprivation on accidents and bad decision-making by sleep-deprived people, the PVT doesn't predict that behavior. So we're going to need more than one gold standard measure. And in fact, one of the things our lab is working on right now is a test that could be adopted more widely that would get at several aspects of attention and the effects of sleep deprivation at once and not just this narrow vigilance measure that the PVT gets at. Are there any reliable changes in breathing or skin conductance or or other physical things we could look at without actually having somebody have to shift their attention and, and do a test? Because maybe they're not too tired, but to be able to know if a person is too sleepy or not? Yeah, there's lots of baseline metabolic measures that go along with getting sleepy. We don't see a lot of effects necessarily on skin conductance. We've actually done a lot of work with skin conductance. But again, one of the things I think that's really important to remember is it's not like our cognitive system as it gets sleepy isn't trying to do some things to keep our performance level up. And so we actually are engaging in some things to actually support our cognitive performance. And we may even, this is a little more speculative, but you certainly see this in other domains outside of sleep deprivation where somebody is cognitively compromised. They recruit other areas of the brain, so their performance might not change, but in functional neuroimaging, you see the brain processes being recruited differently. So there's a lot going on where we try to not have our performance break down. And in fact, where we see the biggest effects of sleep deprivation are not in those areas where you have time to sort of sit back and ponder and take time to make decisions and really think through a problem. Where we really see the effects of sleep deprivation is in these really fast-paced scenarios where you have to make quick decisions or you have to put two things together in a way that you didn't put them before and you're under time pressure. 
those sort of high pressure, dynamically changing scenarios is really where we see sleep deprivation having a huge effect. And I think that's because we're pushing people towards a scenario in which their compensatory mechanisms break down. They can't overcome what sleep deprivation would ordinarily be doing to them, but they've got workarounds for. And so that in and of itself is going to complicate your ability to see some of these things in objective physiological measures. But that work is ongoing. It's a good question. And we hope to put together some of the behavioral indices with some of the physiological indices and be able to answer your question maybe a little bit better in in a few years from now. I know that in some animals, whole lobes of the brain go to sleep in alternate pairs and things like that. And to a certain extent, I think we see bits and pieces of that in humans. I mean, that's something that's really interesting. And I feel like a lot of people might not be aware of if you wanted to talk about that a little. Yeah, to be honest, that's not my greatest area of expertise. It's really about how to measure the effects more. But certainly you're right, is that There's species-specific effects, but again, the sort of good general rule to keep in mind is sleep physiology experts, they do like to use that term, that sleep is not a whole brain phenomenon. In fact, one of the theories of how sleep deprivation affects the brain is called local use theory. And so local use theory says part of what's going on and part of why you see the selectivity of sleep deprivation effects is that the effects of sleep deprivation are going to depend upon what brain circuits you're having to use a lot of while you're sleep deprived. So while you're sleep deprived, if you're doing something that's really exercising a particular brain circuit, it's going to fatigue and break down faster than if you were starting out rested. So that's the idea of kind of local use theory. So, so it sounds like if you're doing something monotonous enough or, or possibly other types of things too, depending on the, the idiosyncrasies of your own brain, if you just need to be sleep deprived for some reason, there, there might be at least best choices as to what to do with your time. Are there other do's and don'ts when sleep deprivation for some reason is just going to happen like it or not? You know, I guess, and this kind of fits in with a theme I think that we've been developing. One of the other things that I think is an important implication that your listeners might want to think about is, you know, not just caffeine, but there's other drugs that people might take to stay awake or to maintain alertness, or there's drugs that are prescribed for particular conditions that people take off-label sometimes kind of as cognitive enhancers. And I guess there's two points that I would make about that that you just want to be mindful of. One is remember the general principle that we keep coming back to, which is that sleep deprivation doesn't have one effect on the brain and cognition. It has multiple effects and it affects some things more than others. So that means a countermeasure like caffeine or modafinil or one of these other alerting drugs, that might help you be more alert, but don't get cocky that that's going to raise your level of performance in some of these other areas that we've talked about where sleep deprivation really affects you. And the other thing that I would say about that is, again, this whole idea of a trade-off. So even with, you know, the genetic variations, we see a particular genetic variation being an advantage in some circumstances, but it could also be in a disadvantage in other circumstances. So it's the interaction between the person, their genetic complement, but also the particular situation. And that's probably also going to be true to these sort of external countermeasures like alerting drugs or like caffeine. It probably is going to be helpful to certain aspects of your performance, but it could also be deleterious to other aspects of your performance. And you might not be very good at noticing that. So again, the best thing to do is, you know, as much as possible, get the sleep you need. But if you're in a situation where that's not possible, the main advice I would give people is to be aware of this cognitive flexibility problem. Be aware that you're highly susceptible to just plowing ahead with the strategy that's usually worked for you instead of maybe the strategy you need at the time. The extent to which you second guess yourself, plant a little seed in your mind to double check yourself or to have somebody cross check you because you probably are going to fall prey to thinking things are going well way too far down the road after you should have switched strategies. Gotcha. So don't do your day trading all night. (laughs) Good example. (laughs) 
you know, there are some people that are not morning people. They hate the mornings. It's like they don't like how they feel for the first three hours of the day. What do you say to somebody like that that doesn't actually like the experience of being freshly slept? I mean, might we take them at their word that that actually isn't when they're doing their cognitive best? Oh, yeah, I think you should take them at their word. There are real individual differences in the extent to which people are morning people or evening people. And part of that has to do with the natural circadian rhythms. Everybody isn't locked in to the rise and fall of your biological arousal at the same times of day. And so there are really morning people and evening people, and it's a pretty reliable trait difference. It also varies with development. So, you know, as a lot of things have come out in the literature, there's really good basis for the idea that you come across sometimes about why are we making teenagers start school so early? Yeah, (laughs) They just really shouldn't be. And so, yeah, absolutely. Different people are going to work optimally at different times of the day. We all aren't naturally on the same schedule. Smart Drug Smarts. So a big, big thanks to Dr. Paul Whitney for taking the time for that conversation. This is one of those issues that's so pervasive, people not getting as much sleep as they know they should. It's sneaky because even if you do it well for a while, you stay on top of your sleep game. It's easy to rationalize. Well, you know, I've been sleeping pretty well for a while. I can afford to cut it short a couple of nights. And that is always a slippery slope. But getting enough sleep definitely does feel good. And if you're the type that monitors yourself, your workout performance or things like that, you do tend to see a pretty good correlation between the previous couple of nights sleep and what you're able to actually put up as far as numbers. Using some sort of sleep tracking gadget is probably the best way to go here. It kind of keeps you honest. I like the Aura Ring, which I've got. It's really good at recognizing when you fall asleep at night and wake up in the morning. But the problem that I've got with it is it doesn't recognize naps. And I do take naps during the day. And I feel like I want the extra credit for those, but I don't get it. But hopefully in a future software upgrade that might get fixed. But we are going to keep things sleep themed in the Ruthless Listener Retention gimmick coming up next. I told you I'd drop one Halloween tip for you. While doing some research on sleep deprivation, I came across a YouTube video. I think this is in the long term urban legend camp that probably predates YouTube, but it was pretty freaky called the Russian Sleep Experiment. You can probably Google Russian Sleep Experiment and find it, but we'll also throw up a link on smartdrugsmarts.com slash 213. But maybe just make a bookmark, save it for Halloween time and creep yourself out a bit. But that's fiction. Coming up next, some facts in the Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Smart Drug Smarts. Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. So the roundworm C. elegans is one of the better studied creatures in biology. If you want to do something bigger than a paramecium, but something smaller than a fruit fly, oftentimes the C. elegans is where research scientists land. One of the things it has going for it is that although it does have a nervous system, it is a very, very simple one with only 302 neurons. And because of this, using advanced microscope techniques, scientists are actually able to watch it thinking and making decisions with single cell precision. Grab all that data, go back and analyze it, try a whole lot of experiments on its C. elegans brothers and sisters. In this past summer, there was an article published in the journal Science looking at a study that was done at the Research Institute of Molecular Pathology in Vienna, looking at how the C. elegans brain makes the decision as to when it's good to be awake and when it's good to be asleep. C. elegans do have waking and sleeping cycles like all animals, and also like all animals, it is somewhat up for debate still what sleep is exactly used for. Is it needed for some sort of inherently good reason, or is it just sort of a low power state when there's nothing else important going on? One thing that sleepy roundworms found worth waking up for was the arrival of fresh oxygen in their atmosphere. They normally live in soil where microorganisms keep oxygen levels fairly low, so the arrival of more oxygen than they might normally expect is a hint that something could be going on, like an animal is digging in the dirt right around them and it's time to scurry for shelter. By adding a cue like this, the scientists were able to quickly wake up roundworms, but they found that when they removed the cue, the roundworms would settle back into sleep if they were predisposed to be sleepy. They described sleep as something like an attractor condition that would spontaneously establish itself as long as no local emergency seemed to be going on, says Manuel Zimmer, the lead researcher in this study. We propose this attractor mechanism as an efficient means how overarching states like sleep and wakefulness can propagate throughout the entire brain. An attractor is a term used by scientists to discuss complex dynamical systems. And this can kind of be thought of as putting a marble in a bowl. The marble's going to naturally roll to the bottom of the bowl unless something else comes along and pushes it up the side. This attractor-like state is created by cells called RIS cells, which are also neurons, and one of the few types of neurons that remain active in the C. elegans during sleep. But they're also active prior to sleep, and they're apparently secreting a substance, which you can think of as like chamomile tea for the roundworm brain, but it reminds the rest of the neurons that they've been awake for a while and it might be time to get sleepy. Eventually, a quorum of neurons form and this attractor state of a sleepy brain takes over. Now, human brains have 284 million neuron cells to every one neuron in the C. elegans brain, so obviously there's going to be a lot of differences, but the scientists feel that these results provide a promising model for studying fundamental principles in how animal brains might be orchestrating sleep. We like to think of ourselves as a digital speakeasy for brain hackers. 
but you can call us Smart Drug Smarts. Okay, so that was it for episode number 213. Thank you for hanging around until the very end. If you enjoyed this episode, you will find everything that we talked about here up online at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 213. And if you missed last week's episode, the final episode of 2017, I talked with Dr. Ellen Bialystok about the multilingual brain, the difference between speakers of multiple languages and speakers of a single language, waved some pom-poms for learning new languages, but of course, we're generally waving pom-poms for almost any sort of learning. And next week, getting back to our roots, talking about a psychopharmacological substance, in this case, a very, very potent and in some cases, extremely dangerous, definitely a don't try this at home one, but a drug that might come in very handy in certain specific situations. I'll probably butcher the pronunciation here, but this one is known as Ibogaine. So I will catch you back here next week, same time, same podcast, and with that same unwavering commitment to helping you fine-tune the performance of your own brain. Have a great week, and of course, stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts Podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smart should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.